Stefan, thank you very much, and I'd like to thank the conference organizers for asking me to speak today on the subject of early pelvic sepsis after iliopouchial anastomosis, antibiotics, IR drainage, and endoluminal drainage. Um, where do I get the... There we go. Okay, so first of all, what is early pelvic sepsis? Um, you know, a lot of the literature, I'll quote, I think a lot of the literature we heard earlier in the day today is highly pre-selected data. All the literature on this subject is widely variable as well. Uh, patient uh, categories are, uh, are very different between studies and studies. But nonetheless, uh, defining what we're talking about early pelvic sepsis, uh, it, uh, I think this definition is pretty good. Abdomen or abdominal or pelvic pain tenderness, tachycardia fever, and leukocytosis that prompts a radiologic or clinical workup revealing inflammation or infection in the peripouch area. Most commonly, the causes are anastomotic leak, a pouch leak, in other words, higher up from the anastomosis, possibly a fistula, usually originating as a pouch leak, Pelvic abscesses, sometimes without a leak, and those pelvic abscesses and pelvic sidewall cellulitis can be due to a contamination at the time of surgery. So as mentioned, the literature is complicated by numerous factors, most significantly the time window involved in many of these studies. Some studies look at 30 days, some look at the same hospitalization, some extend them out to three months, even longer, uh, to incorporate the stoma closure period because sometimes patients become symptomatic after that. Of course, there is the issue of the asymptomatic uh, sinus leak from a, uh, an anastomotic uh, dehiscence discovered at the time of gastrograph and enema in an otherwise asymptomatic patient prior to stoma closure. And then there is the big issue of the incidence of such pelvic sepsis in patients with or without a stoma, and I think that's a real issue. So what is the actual incidence? And I'll, I'm going to get to the eventual topic, but I'd like to lay as a groundwork the incidence, what you can do to avoid it, because my feeling about treating a pelvic septic process is avoidance is first, because the consequences are dramatic of pelvic sepsis. So what's the incidence? Well, basically, there are two meta-analyses that uh, basically agree. Over 14,000 patients looked at in each of those, and it's somewhere between 5 and 10%. However, there are still papers quoting very high rates, relatively speaking, 15 to 20 percent. Here's a study actually out of Europe that looked at 445 patients. They had a 16 percent leak rate and a 6 percent fistulization rate. Of note is in that study, only 27 percent of patients had a stoma. This is a nice picture from uh, Stefan's recent article in DCNR that I've uh, used in order to illustrate the different kinds of leaks you can have. First of all, very rare is the blind uh, tip leak at the tip of the J. That's probably less than 1% of, of pouch leaks. Pouch body leaks is about 15%. Illo anal anastomotic leaks, whether they be due to abscesses and then resulting in a fistula, is the majority of these uh, sources of pelvic sepsis, about 70%. And then there's that phenomenon of the asymptomatic uh, post pouch sinus that's usually picked up on gastrograph and enema prior to stoma closure. That's about 10%, and I won't specifically be talking about that, although we may talk about it in the discussion. So here's uh, some examples of what we're talking about here. You see the black arrow showing uh, the staple line of the pouch that's extended anteriorly and posteriorly. There's a, uh, a, a, uh, an abscess being highlighted by the white arrow. Here is an endoscopic view of the anastomosis showing a dehist anastomosis and the start of a, a presacral or a, a post-pouch sinus tract or abscess. And this is a, 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 an example of a patient who is now several years out from their, their pouch procedure that was sent to me for what is a chronic presacral sinus, which is the usual consequence of uh, closing such uh, pouches without addressing the, uh, the defect uh, prior to the closure of the stoma. Here's a pouch cutaneous fistula, a gastrograph and enema, showing a, a tracking from the ileoanal anastomosis over into the right buttock that then expresses into the skin. So these are the things that we're talking about. So why are we worried about pelvic sepsis? Well, the consequences are very adverse and very severe. There is clearly worse long-term function, increased stool frequency, nighttime control issues, pad usages, and this has been shown in several studies. I, I list one there. However, there's also a dramatically increased pouch failure rate, i.e. a patient's coming to a stoma or a pouchectomy. Uh, this study uh, looked at uh, 200 patients with pelvic sepsis versus 3,000 without pelvic sepsis from the Cleveland Clinic. Only Cleveland Clinic could generate three, 4,000 patients, I guess, except for the Mayo Clinic as well. But the pouch failure rate in those septic patients were 20%, in the non-septic patients was 4%. Now, again, I'll get to the interventional techniques for treating such, but the best treatment is avoidance. Predisposing risk factors for anastomotic leak, no stoma. You don't give a stoma, you're going to have a higher leak rate. This is a meta-analysis of over 1,400 patients that basically showed that a leak rate 
uh, without a stoma was about 4%, with a stoma was 9%. There are a lot of articles being quoted here today, and you can find in the literature that says no change in leak rates with stomas, no stomas, et cetera, but those are selected patient populations at single centers. This is a meta-analysis, and meta-analyses have their own difficulties, I know, but nonetheless, uh, I think most, patient, most individuals doing this surgery know that a stoma is associated with lower leak rates. Steroids, prolonged use of steroids, usually uh, greater than 30 days, and really in my, in my hands, greater than three months, is associated with higher pelvic sepsis rates. Interestingly, blood loss and transfusion, and not so surprising because this usually reflects a difficult intraoperative procedure, and therefore uh, sepsis and anastomotic leak rates are higher. Uh, this study showed that patients who had anastomotic leak rates had a much higher uh, incidence of requiring transfusion, 23%, versus those who did not have sepsis, only 4% received transfusions. Other factors, high BMI over 30, surgeon experience, diabetes, and I'd like to touch base on one of my favorite uh, points that we were discussing this morning, modified two versus um, the standard two-stage technique. I think most people know what a modified two is. You do a total abdominal colectomy, wait six months, get the patient healthy, get them off their steroids, and then they come back for a definitive procedure, a completion proctectomy, an ileal pouch without a stoma. This study is very interesting because it looked at 237 patients that underwent the modified two versus the standard two, and there was a 5% leak rate in the patients who had the modified two without a stoma versus a 16% leak rate in the patients who underwent a standard stage two-stage two procedure with a stoma. Biologics, we're not going to go into that, but basically, if you're operating on a patient who's getting biologics, you should probably give them a stoma if you're going to give them a pouch. Another, a uh, little bit more controversial, but something that I similarly believe in, and that is a close rectal dissection versus a total mesorectal excision. The argument being that if you leave the mesentery of the rectum behind, it will buttress the pouch and hopefully seal any small leaks that occur, occur cu acutely. Not a lot of data on this, but here are two studies. One study looked at uh, 59 patients who underwent either a TME or a close to the rectum dissection. There was 19% anastomotic leak rates in the TME group, a 7% leak rate in the uh, patients who had a close rectal dissection. The second study did not have a control group. They basically reported on 131 patients undergoing a pouch procedure with close rectal dissection. Their anastomotic leak rate or pelvic septus rate was a remarkably low 1.5%. So treatment for early pelvic sepsis is avoidance. These patients, uh, you should get a stoma in patients who are biologically treated on steroids, malnourished, diabetes, and if it's a bloody operation. I believe in doing modified two procedures. We talked about obesity. I do them almost exclusively in the morbidly obese patient, and I think the close rectal dissection is uh, also advantageous. But let's get back to the actual title of the talk, which is treatment of early pelvic sepsis with antibiotics, percutaneous drainage, or interluminal vac therapy. I don't think anybody will argue with the value of antibiotics in a patient who has pelvic sepsis. It's usually administered in all cases, whether it's a fistula, an abscess, or cellulitis. Um, there is some interest in regard, interesting uh, state, um, uh, data, though, coming out of the literature. Namely, if, the, if you can prove or feel that the pelvic abscess slash sepsis is not due to an anastomotic leak, but instead is due to contamination at the time of surgery, simple antibiotic administration will, will, will heal that process without surgical intervention because there's no hole. Uh, this study is in the radiologic literature, came out of the Leahy Clinic. It basically showed that 29 patients out of 34 who had pelvic sepsis who had no evidence of a leak was success were successfully treated with antibiotics alone. Uh, however, uh, interventional uh, drainage procedures by our radiologic colleagues is uh, not uncommon. Uh, patients, uh, when you uh, have a patient who is deteriorating, febrile, and looking like they have pelvic sepsis, you get a CT scan, you find an abscess, you're going to drain it. Uh, typically, uh, that drainage is done percutaneously through the abdomen or through the buttock. Uh, of note is that there is argument and there is an issue in regards to how you should approach this. Should you approach this interventionally with a radiologist placing a catheter, or should you uh, drain it through the perineum or the, excuse me, the anal, ilioanal anastomotic site? Usually, if the abscess is low, it's probably due to an anastomotic dehiscence, and drainage through the anus is probably more effective. If the abscess is high, it's probably better to, to use uh, IR to do your drainage. Having said that, one of the advantages that is felt to be associated with the IR drainage is to then study the catheter, see whether there is a formal leak, and if there is a formal leak, 
leave the catheter in place. Of course, the patient needs to be diverted and wait for the uh, cavity to collapse so as to then occlude the, anastom occlude the uh, leak that's coming from the pouch. This is, uh, some, that's, this is the same uh, shot I gave you before, now with a pigtail catheter uh, placed through the buttock into this cavity. Usually we'll irrigate that catheter to keep it draining with uh, several cc's every shift. The patient continues on antibiotics during this time. We study the catheter prior to removal. If it communicates, leave the catheter in. Otherwise, you'll just get recrudescence of your, of your uh, abscess. Certainly the patient needs a diverting stoma when this is documented that they have a uh, communication to their pouch. Um, even if you do not document a leak, and you pull the catheter, there is still a significant incidence of fistulization developing through that catheter site. Uh, transanal drainage versus IR drainage, people can argue about it. I mentioned to you that usually the lower abscesses are probably better addressed through the anastomosis because that's probably what's at fault. Uh, when two studies, very pre-selected patients were uh, looked at, basically there was no difference in regards to success rates, basically 75 to 95 percent success rates, whether you drain the abscess through the anastomosis or whether you uh, go to radiology. There's a very su sub-select group of patients, which I have no experience in treating, who have a tip of the J leak, but this is described in the literature. This is very rare, less than 1%. You usually pick them up on a CT scan with a relatively higher abscess in the upper pelvis. Sometimes a gastrograph and enema will document the site of leak at the apex of the J. Many of these patients will be kind of indolent and kind of be difficult to diagnose, and most of them in this study, 27 patients who um, had this leak, again from the Cleveland Clinic, 25 of them required uh, an operation to repair this, uh, this, this uh, tip of the uh, J pouch leak. I can tell you that I've never seen it. I was trained at the Leahy and we were, I was trained to put a Lembert stitch over the mid portion of that staple line and then tether it to the inlet of the pouch. Now, I don't know if that uh, creates or uh, eliminates the chance of a volvulus or ischemia or whether it oversows that parallel staple line of the J pouch that has a little potential for leak at it. But I've never seen this in my five, six hundred pouches that I've done. Uh, so I would suggest that creating that, putting in that one little stitch is uh, very worthwhile. So okay, we get to the endo sponge, which uh, created a little bit of controversy in the last session. First of all, this is not available in this country, it's, uh, and so most, most of the literature comes out of Europe. It was first described by uh, uh, Wiedenhagen in 2008, uh, trying to address a anastomotic leak in, in a low anterior section in a coloanal anastomosis. Um, it was su subsequently followed by uh, an article a year later by Van Koperen, who described two pouch patients who placed uh, uh, the endosponge repetitively every two to three days and had healing of the anastomotic leak in 35 and 56 days. Typically, this endosponge technique does take a long time to heal. It takes multiple applications of the sponge, and frequently these patients spend a long time in the hospital. The subsequent studies try to improve upon that process. In other words, these patients typically have 50 15, 20, 30 days in the hospital with repetitive returns for placement of the sponge. So um, Verlin et al. showed that you could use the sponge only three or four times, and then when the tissue becomes cleansed, granulating, and soft, you can then oversew the anastomosis at that time, close the, the fistula, and it shortens uh, the stay in the hospitalization, in this case, to 14 days, as opposed to the 30 and 40 and 50 days in some of the other studies. Here's what the Europeans get in their kit uh, from the Braun Medical Company. That's the endo sponge you see there. The kit, uh, the, in, the, uh, the important components of it are an over tube, these two plastic tubes that you see in the right lower uh, portion of that picture, and then the, the push uh, the pusher that uh, places the sponge into the defect, and a relatively low-pressure vacuum unit that connects to the uh, sponge. This is how it's placed. You take a small caliber gastroscope, you place the over tube on the gastroscope, you scope the patient, find the sinus tract, enter it, push the over tube into the sinus tract, remove the, the, uh, the gastroscope, and now use the pusher to push the endoscope through the over tube into the defect, and then remove the over tube, and now you have the tube connected to the, the uh, low uh, vacuum canister that is applied. So the typical routine is examination in the operating room, placement of a stoma if an anastomotic leak is identified. Nearly all these patients will get a stoma. Uh, 
placement of the endosponge. Then there will be repetitive replacements of the endosponge every three to four days. Most commonly, however, in the endoscopy suite, under sedation, does not require general anesthesia, but it is this technique of taking the gastroscope and finding the, uh, the orifice and placing the sponge using that push technique. That can be continued until closed. However, increasingly what's being done in order to shorten the hospital stay is to do that three or four times and then close it transanally over a small drain that's described that's usually pulled at two or three days and then uh, continuing antibiotics through that period of time. Here are some data that I think was previously referred to. Uh, I think what is important to look at is that this first study uh, from Gardenbrook basically showed that uh, using conventional sponge therapy had a long duration until closure, 70 days, as opposed to this technique of early oversewing, which uh, abbreviated it back to 48 days. But there was still long-term pouch dis dysfunction in these patients, 14 versus 7 percent, you know, 15 percent, 10, 15 percent of patients will have functional consequence in spite of the success of the therapy. The Italian group in that second study, uh, instead of doing an oversewing phenomenon, which I think probably gives some of us some, some uh, concern for possibly then recreating an abscess, they did the same technique except just left it open to then granulate by secondary intention, just sent the patient home after three or four treatments, and they had complete healing at 60 days with the patient only spent about two weeks in the hospital and then came back for their stoma closure subsequently. But again, it wasn't perfect. Seven out of eight had their stoma closed, but the last one did not. So in summary, pelvic sepsis after a pouch procedure, the incidence should be 5 to 10 percent when a stoma is given. It's increased, its, its presence increases pouch failure rates and dysfunction. To minimize the risk of such pelvic sepsis, you should avoid giving a pouch without a protecting stoma in patients who are on steroids, having diabetes, who have received biologics, who are particularly obese. I am a believer in the modified two as being a favorable, as providing a, a, a favorable outcome in many of these patients, as well as a close rectal dissection that uh, is associated with uh, lower uh, pelvic sepsis rates. And then I already described to you how I suture the J-tip. However, when such a leak occurs, the patient needs a stoma, needs antibiotics if they don't already have a stoma. You can drain it through using interventional techniques or through the anastomosis if the, ad, uh, if the uh, uh, abscess is low. Um, uh, if the pouch, if you use the interventional radiologist to place the drain, leave the drain if there is a leak until the leak has uh, sealed. Uh, and the endosponge, uh, I've talked to you about how that's done, but it's not available in the U.S. I can't say that I've tried to do it once in a patient who had a colo uh, anal anastomosis. My experience was not very favorable, but I could tell you maybe in the discussion as to what I would do next time differently. And thank you very much.